Hello AP Physics students, this is Dr. Berenzi. This is lesson 8.1.3. Our objective for these, or excuse me, our objective for this lesson is that we're going to be able to explain why concrete boats and paper clips can float. And we're going to be able to calculate the weight of a battleship with put, without putting it on a scale. And we're going to do this by using properties of fluids that we're going to learn in this video. So the first topic I want to talk to you about, the first of two, is what's called buoyancy. And buoyancy is the a property of um, a phenomenon, excuse me, where when you immerse a body in water, it seems to weigh less in water than it does in air. And this property, or this phenomenon, is called buoyancy. And a sort of a corollary to that is that if the body is actually ends up being less dense than the liquid, then the body is actually going to float on the top of the surface of the liquid. And of course, we're used to that and seeing that in everyday life, you know, because we have, you know, um, inner tubes and stuff like that that you can uh, put to float on water and uh, those little arm. Uh, inflatable armbands that you can put on you know your little brother or sister so that they won't drown when they go into the community swimming pool so these are all uh, things that take advantage of this thing called buoyancy now one of the first people in recorded history to study buoyancy was a Greek mathematician named Archimedes and he lived in a town called Syracuse um, in the uh, first century, I think that's no second century BCE, and um, he discovered a principle about the interaction between bodies, uh, solid bodies, and fluids. So today we call this we name this principle after him, and it says when a body is completely or partially immersed in a fluid the fluid exerts an upward force on the body equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by that body. Now that's a lot to write down, so on my next slide I'm going to give you an example here. So let's take a ship. And this ship is floating on water. Now Archimedes' principle says that if we figure out how much water was displaced by this ship then we can figure out what the buoyancy force is so we have a buoyancy force going up and if we were to complete the free body diagram of this ship we would have the weight of the ship pointing down And basically, Archimedes' principle says that the weight of the ship is going to be balanced by the buoyancy force, which is the amount of weight of displaced H2O. So, the water that had to leave this area, or excuse me, it's actually going to be a volume. So, the amount of water that left this volume, its weight is going to equal this buoyancy force that pushes up on the ship. So the weight of the ship is equal to the weight of the water that was displaced by the ship. And if I want to figure out the mass of that water that was displaced by the ship, I will take the density of the liquid times the volume times little g. So the volume is the amount of volume that was displaced or that's being displaced by the ship. So I can actually immerse things in water and as long as I have a way of calculating the amount of volume that was displaced by that body, then I have a way of measuring the weight of the object, the weight of the ship. 
So let's take, for example, um, a battleship from World War II. And I just put some stats up on here. So I'm going to use the what's called the USS South Dakota um, because I'm from South Dakota. Sorry, there is no USS Colorado. Um, if there were, I would have used that. But uh, we'll go with South Dakota. And uh, uh, I looked up some facts about the South Dakota on the Internet. And, of course, they measured everything in feet, so I had to convert it to meters. But it turns out that the volume of the USS South Dakota is about 32,000 cubic meters, or at least the part of the boat that was under the water line. And the density of seawater is approximately 1,030 kilograms per meter cubed. So I can use this equation right up here to figure out what the weight of the ship was. And so I take the density times the volume times G. That's what I do down here. And when I do that, I end up with 3.23 times 10 to the 8 newtons. If I wanted to figure out the mass of the ship instead, of course, I would have just left off this G here. Because after all, that's the mass of the H2O displaced times G. So I could leave that G off to find the mass of the ship, actually. Because the mass of the ship is also equal to N times G. So I could figure out the mass of the ship simply by taking the density of water times the volume that's being displaced. And I, for the USS South Dakota, would come up with a mass of 3.3 times 10 to the 7 kilograms. Sometimes, what um, another application of using buoyancy to weigh things is that you will have a tub. I mean, of course, we couldn't put a battleship in a tub. But if you put the if you put um, like say a heavy object um, that you could fit into a tub, and if you knew the volume of the tub or the shape of the tub, you can actually figure out. Um, usually, what you'll do is you'll have a water level before the ship or before the object is placed in the water, and then after the object's placed in the water, this water level will rise. And you can use that change in water level to measure the amount of volume of water that had to be displaced. And if you're able to do that, then you can actually figure out what the weight of your object is as well. But I think with ships, they actually have to figure out what the volume is underneath the water line. I don't think there's like a tub that they can put them in or anything like that. But I might be wrong. Maybe maybe when they were in dock or something like that, they put that in. But I don't know. Anyway, uh, moving on. So that's about buoyancy. And then, I want to also, oh, sorry, one more thing about buoyancy that I forgot about. Uh, I want you to think about this because I'm going to put it down as a concept question for tomorrow. So, normally concrete is denser than water. I should have put denser. Uh, anyway, denser. <laughs> Maybe we're going to have a debate about what that. I'll have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure it's denser than water. Uh, so it normally sinks. However, every year, civil engineering students across the nation compete in what's in a concrete canoe race. So, what in the world makes this possible? Oh, hey, I got an email. <laughs> uh, so. I want you to think about that, and then on the concept questions, I want you to answer that question. And we might end up with a lively discussion tomorrow about how that works. Okay, so the second and last topic I want to talk to you about today and is about surface tension. And this is another property of liquids. Um, any liquid will have what's called surface tension. Um, but some liquids have greater surface tension than others. It all depends on the molecular structure of that liquid. Um, water happens to be something that has a lot of surface tension. But what is surface tension? Let me get into that. 
So molecules in the liquid are attracted to other molecules in the liquid. Okay. So if you had a water molecule here, it would be attracted in each direction by all of the other water molecules around it. Okay, so it turns out that the net force on a molecule in the bulk of the volume is, or the bulk of the liquid is going to be zero, right? Because it's equal in every direction, so the net force is zero. But on the surface, that changes. Because we don't have we don't have molecules up here that are attracting it, it turns out that the molecules on the surface of the liquid are going to experience a couple of things here. Number one, they're going to experience a net downward force, so they're going to be attracted back into the bulk of the liquid. And then the other consequence is that there's going to be uh, the neighbors to the left tugging it this way and the neighbors tugging it to the right that way and if you could imagine a piece of string if you're tugging to the left and then you're tugging to the right you're putting that under tension so we say that the surface of a liquid experiences surface tension and that's why we call it that so there are four consequences that of surface tension that I want to describe to you. Uh, this is going to be, there aren't going to be any formulas involved with this, but I just kind of want you to understand that the fact that uh, liquids have surface tension can have some um, pretty interesting consequences that maybe we haven't considered every day. So the first one is that some objects, even objects that have a higher density than water that normally wouldn't float, can actually rest on the liquid on the surface of the liquid, excuse me, if the force per unit length is less than the surface tension's force per unit length. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have a an insect called a water strider that can actually walk on water. And what you may notice is that this, this water strider actually has these really long legs and these long legs actually rest on the surface of, wa of the water and that allows the water strider to distribute its weight over a pretty long length of the surface uh, of the fluid of water. And because water has a surface tension, you'll notice that this water strider's weight is putting an indentation in the water, but the water strider actually is not breaking the surface of the water. So this uh, sur uh, water strider's legs are actually on the surface of the water. There's no part of the water strider's legs that are actually under the water. Uh, and just to kind of give you an idea of how that works, uh, you have, let's say this is the water strider's leg, you have a component of its force, of the surface tension, that is actually pointing up, pointing in a vertical direction. So there actually is a surface tension force pushing up on the water strider's legs that counteracts the amount of weight that the water strider has on that particular leg. So that's how water striders can actually walk across water even though they have a higher density than the water does. Another interesting thing, uh, consequence of surface tension, is that water will shape itself into a sphere. So, on the left here, we have a picture of a big volume of water on the International Space Station. And you'll notice that it has formed itself into a sphere. Well, the reason it does that is because it wants to minimize the amount of surface tension that it experiences everywhere around the surface and the way, best way for it to do that is to form itself into a sphere where it has the maximum amount of volume um, per unit surface ten or per surface area. Now this happens even when a water droplet is falling. Usually we think of water droplets as teardrop shaped like rain or something like that, and we draw a teardrop, 
But in actuality, what ends up happening is that it ends up actually forming a sphere when it falls. And that's for the same reason. Now you might notice that up here, at the very top, where this um, water is dripping out, I'm guessing it's a shower head, I think, you'll notice that they are teardrop shaped, but that's because there's still some surface tension between this wa individual water droplet and the water that is actually still in the shower head. So there's still something pulling up and that's why we see this teardrop shape when we're at the top. But once it actually starts falling, you'll see that all of these water droplets down here are actually spherical. They don't keep that teardrop shape. So a little bit of a myth busted, I suppose. Uh, all right, another consequence of surface tension is that fabrics, we can actually design fabrics that are waterproof and breathable. Well, what do we mean by that? We don't want water, like say you're going camping or backpacking or hiking, you don't want the rainwater to get in and just totally soak you. But on the other hand, you want it to be breathable so that uh, the water vapor off of your body can evaporate into the air. Um, so people actually design fabrics so with very small pores, very small um, uh, spaces in between the threads that will allow water vapor which is the stuff over here on the left it'll allow water vapor to escape and go through the pores whereas larger water droplets uh, will not be able to get in because these um, these threads there are too many threads um, to break the surface tension of the of the water droplet so that's another consequence of surface tension is that we can design fabrics that are waterproof and breathable. And then finally I want to end with a fourth consequence and that is um, that you can usually clean your clothes better with de adding detergent to water or by using hot water because both of those items or doing both of those either of those things actually decreases the water surface tension and that allows the water to actually penetrate the fabric so we're actually trying to penetrate the fabric uh, rather, than a lot, <laughs> rather than trying to keep the water out. So it's kind of like the opposite of the previous slide. So um, no formulas that are um, associated with surface tension that I want you to know or anything like that. It's a pretty advanced topic, but at least I wanted you to get an idea of what it was. All right, uh, AP Physics class, I look forward to seeing you soon in class, and we will talk about buoyancy and work some problems that involve buoyancy um, and uh, get to a little bit, know a little bit more about surface tension. All right, talk to you then. Bye.